Discord. Hello and welcome to the Mastermind Body and Spirit Show. I am your host, Matt Belair. Today, we have two incredible guests for you. The first guest, Sky Nelson Isaacs, is a physics educator, speaker, author, and musician. He has a master's degree in physics with a thesis in string theory and a BS in physics. He brings together the connection between synchronicity, <laughs> physics, and real life using research and original ideas. He is an educator with nine years experience, an award-winning musician and author of Living in Flow. Our next guest, Nick Egan, is an award-winning executive and business coach who utilizes his deep understanding of positive psychology and Buddhist philosophy to encourage personal and organizational growth. He holds a BA in psychology, an MA in comparative religion, and a PhD in Buddhist philosophy. He is the author of Shift, The Art of Transforming Limitations. Both of these guys have been on the show before. They are amazing, and we are going to do a panel discussion and discuss free will, consciousness, simulation, the nature of reality, and so much more. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. It's great to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks for having us on. Thanks, Matt. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Nick. Yeah, great to see you too, Sky. <laughs> yeah, full yeah, disclosure you- to the audience, we, we know each other from, <laughs> I, I would say, at least a decade ago, right? Yeah, yeah. We, we found out that we both knew Matt, and then Matt reached out to us, was like, yes, let's do that. Yeah, like easy, easy yes. <laughs> Yeah, that's so amazing. You know, I did the podcast with with both of you guys separately and we we both stayed in touch and I really enjoyed what you guys share. I think that you're experts in your field and you're very knowledgeable, also very grounded and you can go very, very deep and and um, just really masters of, of what you guys are sharing. And you've both written two incredible books. And when I reached out to kind of discuss a panel on some deeper ideas, I thought about you both and you said you knew each other. And I was like, <laughs> that's hilarious. So I was like, yes, we, there's we have a word to for that. This. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you wrote a book on it, right? Yeah, synchronicity, right? Just the, the alignment where you, you're part of something bigger than you realize. And you have an intention and an idea that comes up in your head and you pay attention to it. You're, you're tuned with the, the flow of uh, information from coming from inside yourself. You know, you, you have this idea to create a podcast, to create a, a panel. You think about people that you've, wanted to bring together on the show and then it just falls in place that i and nick come to your mind as to those people we, we end up having a conversation because i think i actually reached out to you to talk about the work that i'm doing and, and get back on the show at some point and so there's a line there between you and i and and so when we we're in touch with the the inner information that's coming from inside ourselves our intuition whatever that is it aligns with the outer information the outer circumstances and it all falls into place sometimes, you know, but this is, the, this is the practice that we can get into of how to best work within that to create the kinds of results that we want. Well, I think that's a really great area to start on, on synchronicity and living in flow, which is the book that you've written and you reached out and we stayed in touch and you've just developed a course. And I know Nick is developing a course as well because you guys have so much knowledge. So I'm so happy that you guys are sharing, you know, more in depth because even an hour with you guys each isn't enough. And Sky, you wrote a paper recently on simulation theory. So I know we can discuss a lot of things and I'm curious where we should begin. Maybe do we start with them? Um, Maybe Nick, what's your what's your thoughts on just synchronicity and living in flow and like alignment from you know a deep background in Buddhist philosophy and their perspective? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, in Buddhism, there are a few different, uh, I would say, dominant strains of philosophy, and they they each deal with the idea of synchronicity in different ways. But I would say from a uh, Vajrayana or like a tantric perspective, there really isn't much difference between the outer and the inner. So like the microcosm, meaning the internal um, energetic system and including also consciousness in the mind. And then what we perceive as the quote unquote outside world. And so when you think about synchronicity in that way, um, actually everything that we're, we're experiencing is a reflection of our own consciousness and energy. And so it makes perfect sense that there is this, this phenomena of synchronicity. And that if we don't listen to the intuitive messages, both from inside and without, then it, it is possible to kind of get misaligned um, mm-hmm. with our experience, if that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and I wanted to, as soon as you started talking, I, I kind of thought about just something a little bit deeper, you know, in Buddhism, um, that practice when I was in Nepal and doing meditation and talking with them, and I know you were in Nepal as well. One of the things I'm very fascinated about is just the nature of consciousness and the idea out there is like, how do we have a higher consciousness? Right. And, yeah. and I'm wondering how that relates, um, what, what your view on just consciousness and reality is, and then how does that compare to Sky's view from a physics perspective? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, again, there are different ways to talk about what counts as consciousness and, you know, higher consciousness. Actually, if you look at some of the translations, you can talk about consciousness like higher or deeper. Right. And, and so they mean what you're really looking at is like more authentic. Um, and really, I mean, ultimately from that Vajrayana perspective that I was talking about earlier, that tantric perspective that within the Tibetan world is universally acknowledged as sort of the, the highest perspective, um, meaning that it's perhaps the most correct description of reality. What they talk about is reality as a, one, both infused with consciousness, two, that at its core, it's not, um, it's not substantial, meaning that it actually is energy. And that it actually is what they call deity, which is, would be translated more as like divine. So it's like not, it's not a negative or neutral kind of experience from the point of view of the person that's experiencing it. So it, basically the world itself is consciousness. It is also infused with energy. You can't separate out the two, just like water and its wetness and that it is inherently divine, which I think is, and I think that's, I don't know, Sky can talk about that more from a quantum physics perspective. I really see quantum physics as within Buddhism, they talk about base path and then results. So the, the path is sort of like how you attain enlightenment, meditation, and all that. The result is what does it feel like once one might be enlightened? But the base or the basis is like, what's the description of reality that might allow those things to progress? And I think that um, quantum physics really is kind of the modern version of describing the base. They're, they're getting to what actually is reality. Yeah. Um, I really align with everything you said, Nick, and I'm going to give my caveat as a physicist. We really have to figure out how quantum mechanics relates to consciousness. Mm. Uh, we suspect that it does. A lot of people suspect that it does. The people who really practice quantum physics don't mostly suspect that it does, or they, they have challenges in aligning you know, the two worldviews. And so that's where I feel the most important work is. I, I want to connect the two, but I want to do it right. I want to do it rigorously. And so that's a lot of where I spend my hours and my struggle is trying to make that connection. I think it can be done. Let me, let me say that, that that's the point, right? I think it can be done, but I want to, uh, I want to do it right. So when we, we don't, what we know is that for microscopic things, right? For like atoms and light, things that we can't see, but we can measure. We know that they don't have a, a reality to them. A property, I think the best word is property. They don't have properties. Hey, Sky. Yeah. You're a little bit choppy. Sometimes you're coming in and then sometimes you're getting like a uh, robot. Are you getting that too, Nick? Yeah, I was it's wondering. Fine. I thought maybe it was mine. No, you I don't, might, I don't know if you it's your headphones or it could be just the Wi-Fi, but hopefully maybe it's like I'm, a tech thing. Uh, well, I'm hardwired into the, into the internet, so... You huh. sound good now, so hopefully it'll remain that way. Because I, okay. I'm, I'm paying close attention to what you're saying because you're going to physics. It's hard enough as it is. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, please continue. <laughs> so we know that the, the physical objects don't actually have properties without somebody like you and I observing them or some, some device, some tool observing them or interacting with them. And we know that to be true. And so there's a way that, Nick, you talked about uh, the non-substantialness, mm -hmm. the non-substantialness of physical things, right? Mm -hmm. um, we know that that's actually true at a microscopic level. And I think it's true at a, at a macroscopic level. And that's the work that I'm doing right now, trying to understand the world as a hologram. Mm -hmm. And a, a hologram is a, a three-dimensional image that appears on a two-dimensional piece of paper. And so it looks like it's real. And yet there's a way it's just when if you take away the, the light that's shining on it, it's just a piece of film with interference patterns on it. That's flat. It doesn't, it doesn't resemble the, the image of the Eagle or the face or whatever that is buried in it. Mm -hmm. um, you might see these on your credit cards, right? Like a, a hologram that looks like an Eagle. And the idea is that 
the physical world could be much the same. It, it is a, a physical world that is defined all at once. Like the picture on a hologram is defined all at once. You look at it and you see the, the whole image of the eagle and then you turn your credit card a little bit that way and you see an image of the eagle that's a little bit to the side. Mm -hmm. Turn it the other way, you see a different image of the eagle. So you've got this, this, this eagle that is represented all at once in the, in the that you see it from a specific perspective. And, mm -hmm. and what, this, what this means about the physical world, I think, is that we are experiencing a particular perspective right now on the physical world, but it's defined all at once. So our entire timeline from past to future is, is actually predefined. It's not necessarily predetermined. Like there are actually many different possible branches that we could take, but all of those branches are predefined. Uh, you can think of them as film strips. You know, we've, we've actually got the film strips of our lives branching out ahead of us. And what we're doing when we're, when we're acting in the world is choosing between those film strips. Yeah, I, I want to, that's really interesting. I like the idea of the hologram. I mean, obviously like, like in ancient times, holograms didn't exist. Um, and so they weren't used as an analogy as such, but there, there is a similar analogy in some of the Dzogchen Tantras for anybody that's um, deep into Buddhist philosophy. And they talk about the nature of reality is actually a projection. And so what they, what they say is like, imagine a um, lamp with five little holes cut out of it. And then you put it over a candle and then what's projected out is this light, this experience from that lamp. And the five holes represent the five senses. And then, of course, the mind, too, at being the sixth. Um, and that that actually constitutes reality in our experience of it. And I would say that it, it goes along perfectly with this idea that the world is holographic in, in a sense. Um, and certainly non-substantial from an actual, like, physically existing perspective. Uh, Buddha said, you know, 2,500 years ago, there is no atom, no, in, no indivisible particle, right? That you can keep, keep dividing and dividing until you essentially you get energy. Um, I, I would say maybe the difference or maybe a, a point of further discussion or exploration is that in, within the a Buddhist framework, reality, there is no real objective reality that's happening, right? So like what, what's happening for me, there's an entire universe that's coming from my consciousness and it's sort of, I'm experiencing that entire universe. Like I can go mm -hmm. literally light right. years and so can each one of us. And they, we kind of can imagine that they're connecting in some way. We can have like a common language and all that, but when it really gets down to it, it's all coming from that one consciousness that's, that's pervading out. And so that's the idea that, um, you know, in, in some of the Upanishads in the Hindu text, they talk about that. Like when you kill one person, you're killing the entire universe because that's mm -hmm. their experience of the world, right? So right. we carry that projection right. with us. Right. And, and that, that perspective really aligns with this concept of relationality in quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. where we're just coming to, to be able to physically test and conclude that of all the interpretations of quantum mechanics, it may be the ones which have relative reality are the ones that are correct. In other words, when I observe something and it becomes real for me, it doesn't become real for everybody else in the world. It becomes real for me. And then you and I are in separate uh, in some sense, separate worlds, and when we meet up, those worlds align. It's yeah. just like just like the analogy to gaming. If you've ever played a video game with somebody across the world, what happens is typically the the game is on your your computer. It's not in the internet somewhere. It's on your computer, and it's connected to somebody else who's also got the game on their computer. It's a separate virtual world, right? But your worlds are communicating and sharing information. But you shouldn't forget that there's not a central server that's running the whole thing. Mm -hmm. It's, Scott, I'm wondering, I'm, I don't mean to interrupt, but you're getting a little choppy again. I'm wondering if it's because you're live streaming also on Facebook. I don't know. Maybe oh. the computer is lagging a bit. Let me check. I just checked my bandwidth and I've got nice, nice speeds, but I'll, I'll just close Facebook. Make sure that's all closed up. Thank you for letting me know. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, it's interesting. <sighs> like what counts as experience? I mean, I'm kind of reminded of this famous koan, which are these riddles within Japanese Zen that are, that are designed to uh, um, disrupt ordinary thinking for you to get a deeper insight. Uh, and probably the most famous is like, if a tree falls in the forest, does it make a sound, you know? And I mean, yeah. my answer would be like, what flipping tree, you know, there isn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but that's from the point of view of like somebody that if you're not experiencing it, then where is the reality? If there's no one to experience it, well, what, what quantum mechanics, I think, says about that koan is 
if a tree falls in a forest and you are not there, then it, the tree remains in a superposition of mm. fallen and not fallen. So and every and every other possibility as well, like struck yeah. by lightning, you know, yeah. uh, birds nest in it, like every single Well, every other possibility that is consistent with the information you have. Right. Well, but no, but no, in an unactualized way, right? It's the potentiality right. of the, of the energy. So another way to think about it is like, where does fire come from? Right. So like a, there's fire, there could be a, a, a piece of flame right here. If I had the right causes and conditions, one of which is the, the consciousness of the observer. And so it's like, Oh yeah, is there fire every, is there literally fire in the entire universe? I mean, kind of from a potentiality perspective, right. As long as the, the causes and conditions are there. And I think right. people get, people get tripped up in the fact of it. Like, well, how can infinite versions of this thing actually exist? Well, it's like the potentiality of those things exist once the, the right conditions create the actuality. Yeah. And what's, what's beautiful about quantum mechanics is that it, it's pointing out saying potentiality is more than you think it is. There's a certain amount right. of reality to the potential. It's not actually real, but it's not just an idea on paper. Yeah, that's, I, I really like that. I, one of my teachers, um, Zong Sar Kien Seram Shea, he's a brilliant, brilliant Tibetan teacher. Um, he always talks about like the limitations of the human mind. And he says, look, right now you think that piece of paper is just a piece of paper. But if, what you're thinking, the way that you're thinking about it is trapping that potentiality within that paper. And it could be a bathtub or it could be a desk or it could be whatever it is. And it's like, it's, it's just one potential stop on an infinite journey of causes and conditions that are going to result in some kind of experience for the person that's observing. Right. And I think we can, we can make some progress on, you know, not thinking of it as like infinite potential because mm -hmm. that's, that's really a, not a very meaningful way to think about things. The infinite potential just gets rid of all possible conditions and mm -hmm. then what are we left with? But you know, the tree falling in the forest, it could fall or it could not fall. It could also be struck by lightning if there's a storm system that came through. Mm -hmm. It could also have caught fire if there was the conditions of uh, humans in the area that might have lit, lit a fire by accident or a storm mm -hmm. system with, with thunder. So we start thinking about all the interconnected conditions and start looking at what are all the possibilities with those conditions and are all interconnected farther and farther outward in a conspiracy of correlations. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, that, that connects back to you in some way, right? You're a little, you might be a little bit aware, aware of the weather but you're not seeing the tree, so you don't know. You might know that there's no, no lightning. You don't know whether it's falling or not falling. Yeah. Well, Sky, you, you, I just want to jump in real quick because, yeah, um, you know, immediately when you started to talk about like the hologram as a theory, I remember I had uh, Thomas Campbell on the podcast, and I also, and this was in one day. Um, I had Thomas Campbell on for three hours talking about the physics uh, correlating towards simula simulation theory. Then I had David Lone Bear Senepas on, who's a Native American elder, but also a mathematician and a scientist. And right. he said we're in a simulation too. And so I was like, well, that's uh -huh. fascinating. And so the question that I have is, is for both of you, let's just say for a moment that if we were experiencing a simulation or a hologram and, and maybe um, our actual selves is somewhere else or, or whatever we're in can continue into, into future lives or, or uh, some other existence, what would that mean for the nature of free will? Like, do you guys believe we have free will? And, and, and if we were in a simulation, do you think that that would take away the meaning of life? Or do you think it would inspire you to, um, you know, maybe chase your dreams or do all those things that are your deepest desires? Great question. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Thank you, Nick. Before, before we dive into free will, which I think is a really – in fascinating question and not at all simple. I think no matter what kind of background you're coming from. Um, you were destined to say that by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I didn't want to say it, but I kind of, um, yeah, the, the idea of like a simulation, I think in English, at least to me, to my ears and my understanding, it, it comes with a little bit of the sense of like, there is something that is creating the simulation that is not us, right? right. And I don't know that that's really what simulation theory means. I mean, I, I, would, I definitely want to get Sky's input on this. 
but from my perspective, like it's, it's actually Maya or sometimes like Lila, which would be like an illusion or the play or the display of illusion. And so like, is there an actual quote unquote objective reality, even, even like a subject, subjective reality that's called into question. So from that perspective, this theory has been around for a very long time. And I think you find it, even if it's not within major religious traditions, it's certainly within the mystical traditions. You know, I mean, you can talk about Spinoza, you can talk about all these guys, quote unquote, Christian people that also talk about some element of this. Um, and so I think from that perspective, yeah, it is definitely a, a simulation in the sense that it's an illusion, a play of illusion. I don't think that there's a, an outside projector of the simulation, which is at least from what I've seen in like Elon Musk's tweets and stuff like that. It's, it's like that, like, there's some higher level alien that's like, it's all an illusion creating it <laughs> like the holodeck or something. I don't know. Right, what do you right. think, Sky? I completely agree. Uh, I feel the same exact way that, you know, we have this the fantasy or the, which is great. You know, we had the matrix come out and it, there's these uh, the computers that are controlling that simulation, right. For a purpose. And of course the purpose isn't a fair movie tickets. Right. <laughs> but, but I don't think that there needs to be, or is something outside the simulation creating it, I think the point is exactly what you said, and this is something I've been writing about for an upcoming work that I'm doing. Uh, Maya has been around as a concept in Hindu philosophy for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Maya is the, the illusion, the way that reality is elusive mm -hmm. or illusory. And I don't know that this is the only way to look at Maya, but the way that has been really relevant for me lately is looking at the layers of emotion that come up for me in response to the, to the events of my life and recognizing how those layers of emotion or conditions that I've, that I've put on myself over time, like I'm going to react when, when my wife says, will you please empty the dishwasher? A certain set of emotions comes up. Like, what does she like mean love, by that? Love and gratitude? All the time. Yeah, love and gratitude. <laughs> Just full on. <laughs> and those emotions color my experience and they color that they create a filter and this is where the mm -hmm. the the work on physics can actually come into the work on spirituality in in the, in this simulation concept because what we're really doing is filtering out the information we get and interpreting it according to the choices we've made in the past of how to respond to our lives yeah that's uh, I, that's brilliantly said, boy, this is uh, I love these panels. This is a great panel, Matt. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot to talk about. I know I don't want to lose the theme of getting back to free will, but I just want to chime in. Um, there's a, there's a word in Tibetan bok chak, which means like your karmic tendencies, right? And it's this idea that you're constantly experiencing the, we'll call it reality through these filters, exactly like what Sky was saying. And the final reality, the final veil, the final thing that's keeping us from experiencing that is something called klishto mano vijnana, which means um, the grasping, the, the grasping at the self, the, the mind self. And so there's just like subtle, very subtle filter that we're always experiencing the world through. That's like, no, I'm separate from everything. And from a Buddhist perspective, the moment you can kind of let go of that, then you actually experience total consciousness as it is, which is all around us all the time and is us. I mean, you can't, that's where you start to lose, you start to lose um, regular language because it, regular language really predicates itself on there's a, there's somebody that's not something else, right? It's like you, you have to see, you, you're distinguishing things out. Like my coffee cup is not the salt shaker is not me, but at a ultimate level, it's impossible to, to titrate those things out, which brings me back to action and, free will. So from an ultimate perspective, actually there is no, there is no action, right? There is no, there is no free will because there's nothing to actually be done. Right. So what, does that make sense? I see. You'd have, I know. You'd, have, you'd have well, to explain that well, to me further. Explain a little more. Okay, so <laughs> I think, like, I think so we've gone beyond words, right? We're, we're in that a little bit. Yeah. Unexplainable place. Well, it yeah, makes definitely. me think about like the difference between like being, right? Being and doing. 
And so like, if I think about free will, the reason why I think that we, we have it is because we have the ability to choose when Sky was talking about those film strips, you know, at some point when, when we learn something, we can respond to a new experience in a different way, whether it's the dishwasher or something in our environment, we can look at that and, and it could be a negative thing that we perceive it as negative or in, you know, Buddhism and Zen, they'll say it just is right. It could be like you, you got hit by a car and you know, you broke both your legs. It could be negative or it's how you, how do you respond to that situation? And I think it's in our response that dictates the direction of our life. So I think that's where we get to choose. And that's where yeah. um, yeah. I think free will comes from. It's, it's kind of in the vein of what you were talking about, but not really yeah. the, the, what you were thinking about is just like, maybe I'm just going to be whatever's going to happen. I'm just going to experience this whole thing. And, and it's kind of like, uh, I like the um, Bill hits, Bill Hicks quote where he's like, life is just a ride. You know, it's got ups and downs and rounds yeah. and rounds and it's like mm -hmm. scary and thrilling for a time. And that's mm -hmm. kind of what it is. Sometimes I feel like I'm on this crazy roller coaster that I'm just observing like, Oh my goodness. Yeah. Like, this is yeah. one intense experience. Right. Well, Nick, Nick, I think you're talking about being brings back, that brings us back to experience. I Ooh. think when, when we talk about how does synchronicity show up in our lives, how does the world respond to the choices we make? This is really my answer to the question of, is, do we have free will? Well, we do, but the world we live in is responsive. So there's this dynamic dance that we're playing mm -hmm. with it. And that experience is what is ultimately guiding it, not mm -hmm. words and concepts about who we are, which makes us feel separate from each other and from our experiences, but the actual experience that we are having. And each of us is having that right now. We're each having an experience, which is, separate which is again it's not the mental layer it's it's what's what we're feeling and thinking and all that put together into being present right here in the moment and that being present when we're present with our experience it isn't colored by our impressions or our filters or our conditions it is what it what it is that's a bad phrase i think but it is a set of conditions that we then get to choose if we can see it clearly without those filters we can have some actual free will some actual choice over ourselves and what, how we respond. And so I think maybe the most important free will we have is the, the choice over how we respond to a situation and how we change our response over time based on the growing and learning that we want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I agree with that completely. And I think from a path perspective, meaning you're, you're talking about action and volition, it, you know, so intention behind something as like a real thing, um, I think that you're both of you are exactly right that it's I also sky hate the term it is what it is because I like to ask like is it ever what it isn't because that <laughs> case, then you can talk about that um and maybe it will anyway, be soon yeah yeah exactly <laughs> maybe it has been in this whole time um so something happens so there's something that happens to you and within a buddhist formulation that's a that's karma right karma actually just means action so it's the results it's the the fruition of something so you so my answer to like, is there free will? There is no free will kind of looking toward the past, if that makes sense. So like what's happening now is the call, is the result of previous things that I have done in the past, right? Even, even as simple, even like uh, the most Newtonian scientist would agree. Like I have my teacup mm -hmm. here. That's the result of me walking over to get my teacup. Like that's, that's the cause and condition. We don't need to go into like past life, etc. cetera. Um, but what I choose to do, one, how I choose to experience it, which goes to Sky's piece of like, what are the filters? Like, do I like that teacup? Do I not like it? Do I, am I ambivalent toward it? Those are basically the three main filters. And then how do I act toward it are going to determine the future of my interaction with that thing, right? And so it's, it's actually not, we, it's not complicated in the sense that it's metaphysical. The, the problem is that most of the time we don't see causes and conditions. And sometimes I actually, with, with some of my clients and students, I'll, I'll give this example. If we're, we're sitting in a room meditating or something, I'll ask them all just to close their eyes really briefly. And then I'll just move an object and I'll have everybody open their eyes and I'll say, well, what, what happened to this object? How did it move over there? Like the obvious example is I moved it, but then I think, well, what other crazy causes and conditions could there be? Maybe an alien came, maybe there's a ghost. If you believe in that, that came, maybe there's an earthquake that you didn't feel. You can come up with all these crazy causes and conditions but the most crazy one is if there's no cause and no condition at all. That is absolutely crazy, right? If you said, oh, there's no cause or no condition to that cup moving over here, 
that that makes no sense. Like even a two year old knows that that's not the case, mm -hmm. right? So so just because we don't see the causes and conditions all the time doesn't mean that they're not there. And so it's important to keep that in mind all the time. Yes, uh, and I, I like that you talk about karma. Um, I think about synchronicity as a mechanism that helps us experience karma. Mm -hmm. I think of there's a cycle that synchronicity can play into. Synchronicities being you know meaningful coincidences that, sh that show up when you you're on a path, but you don't know how you're going to get there, and then the path gets filled in by life events that magically seem to point you to where you're trying to get to. Mm -hmm. And these events can show up as part of a cycle of healing, mm -hmm. part of a cycle of working out karma. I think of healing, it, there's lots of ways we could define it, but I think of healing as the peeling away of layers that come from our childhood or from our previous experiences. The layers of, you know, my parent or my sibling or my friend said something that I didn't have the maturity or the grounding to really respond to as a whole person. And so I sort of splintered off and that, you know, made up some, some, some careful response, but I didn't let them know who I, how I really felt or I learned how to adapt my behavior. You know, when my mom didn't laugh at my joke when I was 11, you know, and I, I learned that I had to be a little more, uh, reserved as to when I make jokes because it's embarrassing when people don't laugh, you know. So then I, I, I have a filter that comes on about who I am and, and what's, what my qualities are, which is like I'm, I'm maybe not as funny as I wished I was. Mm -hmm. And then the healing is a, a, the ability to peel that back and get back to who I was before that, have the ability to, you know, be authentically funny if that's what it is you know it, even when I, I have this this voice or this layer that's telling me oh don't you shouldn't do that it's not safe because i've got this past experience and so there's a cycle that i i describe in my workshops where you start with some hidden feeling a hidden feeling maybe, oh, you know I, I shouldn't make a joke in this situation because no one's going to laugh and i'll be embarrassed and then i have an experience from that which is uh not what i want you know i have some some interaction where it gets very serious or I just feel like left out of the conversation and everyone else is having fun and I'm not because I couldn't, I didn't have the courage to, to speak up when I wanted to. And then the, 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 there's a good side to this, this difficult emotion that I'm experiencing, this feeling left out because it makes me more than ever yearn to be part of the conversation and to share myself authentically. And that yearning is me essentially anticipating the experience I want to have. So I, I can visualize in my head and in my heart, I can feel what it feels like to be included and to be part of the funny conversation and to laugh and enjoy myself. Even though I'm not doing that on the outside, I can feel what that feels like and anticipate the experience itself. And what that does in, in the model of the, the branching tree of all this, these holographic possibilities, these film strips that we were talking about, all these many film strips branching off, it identifies which of those film strips have the experience of me feeling connected and, and included and part of the conversation. And those ones grow apples, if you want to think about it metaphorically, like they weigh down the possibilities. And in doing so, they make it more likely that events happen which get me there. And so what I can expect from this cycle is once I've really started anticipating and feeling what I want to feel, what I want to experience. I can expect another situation to show up, which gives me the opportunity to do that. But it might be not what I expect. It might be something like I'm asked again, you know, I've given another opportunity to make a joke and this time I go for it. Or this time it might be an opportunity to, you know, sing karaoke. And the last time I wasn't going to do it because I was too scared, but this time I've done a little bit of healing because I see the pattern. I see, oh yeah, I had this thing when I was a kid and this happened and my mom didn't laugh at my joke. And now I, I, I'm always afraid to, to make a joke because I'm so embarrassed and that's me when I was 11, but it's not me when I'm in my 40s. And so in my 40s, now I have the chance and the opportunity to choose differently and synchronistically that, that opportunity will come mm -hmm. as part of a cycle of karma yeah. to allow us to, to heal that karma. Well, <clears throat> what you guys are talking about, it, it, it segues nicely to the question I, and direction I wanted to go because I'm, 
I think what I understood from, from what Nick was saying, it's like, we are living in this like mystery, you know, and, and, the, and when we look at, and Sky might feel differently because he's a physicist, but we, uh, we only know a little bit of a little bit of what there is to know. The, oh, yeah. you, know you could study one, a pine tree, your whole entire life with a lineage of people who only studied pine trees from every science um, discipline there is. You'd only know a tiny little bit because so much of what's happening in nature and biology and physics and life is just unbelievable and almost unexplainable. We are seeing cause and effect here and there and we're learning things and we're growing, but, but the unknown and the mysteries are so profound. So maybe something random and unexpected could happen. And we want, let's say this result, we, we take these actions to get this result, but all of a sudden um, maybe the result comes in a way you could never imagine ever. And Dr. Joe Dispenza will talk about right. that through meditation. He'll say, meditate on maybe something that you want. It'll come in a way that you could never expect it. And so the question that I wanted to ask and, and what I wanted to share and, and hear your feedback on is what do you guys think it is possible as far as uh, human experience here? Because I think that there's levels, there's like the inner environment, right? The inner experience. You could have a human being, you could say, I don't know, the Dalai Lama or Jesus Christ or somebody who is quote unquote enlightened and they move around and what might enlightenment be? It might be pure surrender to life, like a feeling of peace and ease and trust and faith, like 100%. And so they're going around life in that, in that way or happiness and joy most of the time. I don't really know. You guys can kind of speak on that. But there's the inner environment, right? The people that you look at in the world and they might not have a lot of material things, um, but they have genuine happiness and joy and gratitude. And that's a very high state of being. Um, and then you've got like the the creation or manifestation maybe a person has a goal and they want to create that goal and we're using these different tactics we're using what i we know in the physical realm of hard work we're using the mental tactics of possible like positive psychology visualization things like that and you've got maybe the realm of the masters they say they could manifest just with thought you know again going into some of uh, dr joe's work where people are curing themselves of terminal illnesses through meditation um it's not 100 percent always but there is enough documented cases of people having dramatic um, healing through meditation practices, positive visualization and things like that. And so then we have the, what I consider the final stage is if we cultivated this very powerful and genuine state of contentment, surrender, happiness, joy, we would, we would create something that, that we were aspired to create. And then we would probably want to contribute. And people see things in the world like starvation and oppression and things like that. And could that one individual have the power to, let's say, stop all of starvation, stop all uh, organ harvesting, stop all of the trafficking, the human trafficking in the world? That would be amazing. That's kind of the line of, of things that really bother me in the world and I'd love to influence. And at the same time, it's almost like I feel like that's, I don't know if that would ever be in my realm. Like, is there a person that be could become so powerful that they could influence that in their hologram or do you think it's something like we're playing our piece in our section and our, and our job is to cultivate that inner environment and do the best we can within the mystery and i think that to you know nick's point earlier it does seem like those deepest questions they're going to remain mysterious we're going to figure out something to a degree but it's kind of like the quantum split experiment that you know as soon as you put the observer in it starts to act normal again so it's not going to let you get to that next level in this space or consciousness that you're in and i'll leave it with that and well and I, I think that there's a really important short piece i want to put in there from from my work which is when we are in flow this is the magic of flow when we're in flow there is an alignment between what we need for ourselves what's good for us in our lives and the world around us so we don't actually have to go out there and figure out what's the most important problem i'm going to go help solve that the most important problem is being presented to you right now in your life already and it's a hard one in front of you that if you start tackling the problem of what am I here to do? How do I show up in my relationships? How do I show up in my work life in a way that is most optimum for me? Then by doing that, I start to make a difference, uh, rippling out synchronistically and directly in the, the, in the world around us. So I think that we don't need to go looking for a problem to solve. 
we, we start where we are and we, we focus on how do I live myself and my life the fullest I can because that's the way that I can really contribute. And I'm, I'm curious, Nick, you've done a lot of great work in the, the world of business and I'm wondering you know, how you see these principles specifically showing up and influencing the way we're able to make a difference in the business world. Yeah, I, while you were talking, Scott, I was just reflecting that uh, I, love, I love your practical advice and I'm like, how did, the, how did the quantum physicists get to be more practical than me? In terms of the advice you're giving, I'm like, we need to, I need to make more regular time to talk to you. <laughs> Practical. Um, yeah, so, okay, first, Matt, great. There was a, a bunch of potential questions there. The first thing is I, I want to talk about um, kind of, you mentioned manifesting and spontaneous healing and all of that. From a Buddhist, I'll say from a Dharmic perspective, from meaning like all, most, I'll say most, most spiritual traditions coming from the East. Um, there is this acknowledgement that you can create, you can manifest things. And the idea, it's actually really simple. You just draw a graph. It's like the strength of your concentration, the strength of your mind, your focus directly dictates how well you can manifest something. Now that's not the how of, that it works. It's just that you could do that. And of course, like enlightened people and all that can create their reality. Um, and certainly like after once people die, if you're in like a non-incarnate, realm right in what what most christians would call like a heavenly realm or something like that an astral realm then it becomes much easier because you're not weighed down by the seemingly solidity the seeming solidity of the physical world and how that actually happens is because the world itself isn't ultimately solid we just are convinced otherwise does that make sense so that's like the sort of yes i'm agreeing with you and it is in direct line with like how strong your mind is now the trouble is most people's minds aren't that strong and and one of the ways to make them much stronger, of course, is a meditation, but also like faith, faith and um, compassion and positivity. So for many people, it's much, much easier to create faith in Jesus or in Buddha or whatever and channel that very strong energy towards manifestation as opposed to just sitting down, focusing on breathing, getting a very clear mind for years and years and years and then, and then doing it. Um, so I don't want to discount the power of faith within that. Um, and then the other thing you asked is a really good question. Like what, at what point can an enlightened person, let's say, influence the, the reality, the simulation, the, the Maya of other people? Um, and I think Sky's point is very, very practical. Like once you are more in line with your own healing, you know, capital H healing, which means like paying attention to your intuition, paying attention to these karmic tendencies and really being able to create positivity in the world, there is this ripple out effect. Now, that being said, if I could totally influence another person's reality, then we wouldn't need to be doing anything at all, right? Because all it would take is like one Buddha or one Bodhisattva, let's say. And a Buddha or a Bodhisattva is like somebody that's committed their entire being toward the enlightenment, the ultimate happiness, the ultimate joy of the entire universe. Then they wouldn't, we wouldn't need to actually do anything if that were possible because the Buddha would have already done it. Otherwise, he's not compassionate at all, which is where you get these you get a weird dichotomy within Western, some Western religions where they talk about like, well, God is, if God is both all powerful and all good, you know, why is the world so screwed up? And it creates this weird, and then you go down all these theodicy, like the problem of evil and all this stuff. But it, within, within the Dharmic traditions, it's just not possible because we have to understand our own reality. We have to get to the nature of what's real from our experience. It can't be done for you. Just like I can't eat food for you. I can't exercise for you. You have to do that yourself. Well, I think you just brought it right back to karma because yeah. that is, the, in my understanding, the role of karma is saying, look, you created this for yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't complain that the world is a painful place. This is what was created. Now, granted, you don't create the circumstances of suffering specifically. You don't create the terrible disasters that might happen to you or just, you know, it, there's a way in which the symbolism is what we create for ourselves. Not the physical circumstances. The, me the meaning, the felt experience. The meaning, the meaning yeah. and the felt yeah. experience is up to us to choose. That is exactly right. So we bring to ourselves experiences that allow us, and this is a key, key word, allow us to work through those experiences that we've chosen. Even encourage, even encourage us to do that. Right. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the idea is that we, we should want to do that. Like mm -hmm. the more, I think the more enlightened we get, the more we seek the next struggle because we know that beyond it, is more liberation, more freedom to be myself, to be authentic, to enjoy my life. But I got to get through this thing that's holding me back. 
And mm -hmm. as long as I don't get through it, I'm still stuck behind it. So mm -hmm. if, if I'm wise, I want that experience and I want to go through that suffering. Yeah, exactly. We talk, I think we talked about this last time I was on, Matt. It's like you don't go to the gym and get mad at the weights for being heavy. <laughs> right? But that's what people do. They're like, God damn, this is so hard. Everything's a struggle, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, you're, go you're going there to work out. And once you feel that struggle, it means you're growing in some way. And right. sure, do those weights eventually become not as heavy? Absolutely. You get stronger, you know? Right. Yeah, I think you guys Beautiful. brought up really, really great points. And that's kind of how I see it too, because what I've noticed in, let's say, healing are people who are struggling with different things. It could be alcoholism or trauma or, or something like that. That individual has to want to heal and they need to go through the process in their own way. And when they're mm -hmm. ready to heal, they can either heal themselves or receive the help that they need to actually overcome it. And if you were to make it so that nobody experienced any kind of adversity or suffering, then you'd be kind of taking away what they needed to learn. Because I've also seen a lot of stories of people just facing unbelievable adversity and challenge in life, but then overcoming that and making a massive impact. But it doesn't mean that that adversity is easy or that it's just, it just means that that's the individual that's going to need to figure out how to get through it. And I love, there's this meme of uh like a, I think it's like a little wolf and he's, he got stabbed by a, like a spear or something. And it's like, you don't, um, life doesn't get easier. You get stronger. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's what, what it, what it seems to me is like the challenge that I see is that I see some of the stuff in the world, like that's just so awful. And I'm like, Holy crap. Like it would be great to have a magic wand to fix that. And I totally agree with sky where I can only do what I can within my realm. And the more that I can have a harmonious peaceful, um, abundant, kind, generous existence where I am and through my work and through my livelihood, um, the more I am sending out a positive ripple and even eventually helping that. And if I get to a stage in my own development where I could make an impact in, in, an, in an issue that was uh, bothering me, I could then I could then direct my energy and my knowledge and my experience toward that. And I kind of wanted to ask um, your guys' thoughts on this, but in, in Buddhism, it talks about the eightfold path, and I really like how simple it is. And I also like when it talks about a vocation. And I feel like a lot of people listen to the podcast and, and go down these deep rabbit holes. A lot of us, we want to live a life that's, that we're passionate about, that, that really contributes in a way that uses our skills, our, our unique abilities, and our unique interests. What do you guys think about how does someone get into that vocation, whether it's like a flow state or whatever the case is, because life is challenging and it requires dollars to do everything. And so a lot of people want to move there, but they, they face a lot of fear of, of leaving the job that they're in that's, that's settled and they, they don't want to kind of move that. So how would you use this deep discussion to kind of give them the courage or information they need to kind of direct it on a path because uh, of their own choosing? Because I feel like that, is like the spiritual, not spiritual, but like it's a vocation. It's who you are, right? Um, I use the analogy of going into the forest and you look at a beaver and it's trying to be um, like, a, like a hawk or something. And the hawk is trying to be a goose and everything, <laughs> everything would be chaos. But if everybody was being who they were, um, right. the whole forest would benefit. And I think that's true of people that when they really connect to who they are, that's the thing that they contribute to their community and other people. Matt, yeah. that the the beaver, the hawk, and the goose—that's the most Canadian <laughs> analogy I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> they're up they're drinking the maple that syrup. Should. And, yeah. <laughs> I should have said the goose and a moose, and it would have been yeah. perfect. <laughs> be perfect. Yeah, yeah, and then a hockey player comes along. Um, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna defer to Sky for the majority of this because I think his book speaks so eloquently about kind of finding, um, tuning into the intuitive. Uh, impulses to be able to find the, the biggest impact in the world. Um, but I'll just say from a, from a Dharma perspective, the, the concept of right livelihood and like right path, it really comes, and people forget this often. Yes, of course, it, there is an external reality to that. And, and Buddha said very clearly, like, you know, if you are creating bullets or murder weapons or something that may, you may need to get out of that particular industry. Like if there's an industry where you're directly causing harm to other beings, um, even if, that, if that's not your direct intention, that it, it becomes questionable. But for the most part, like what makes right livelihood is actually the intention that you bring to it. And I talk about this with my clients sometimes. It's like, look, 
okay, let's say you're in tech, but are you every day bringing your compassion, your intention to impact the world to your highest possible extent? And, and once you do that, it's amazing how um, the world kind of comes in line. And, and all of a sudden, like some of the leaders that I work with or, or even burgeoning leaders, once they get clear on their core values and get really clear to how they live their intention on a daily basis, every single day they go to work, it's like they, it's a rocket ship taking off. You know, that, that promotion that was six months out all of a sudden is immediate or that business that they've always been scared to create, they just create it and it's like so successful. So there is something really powerful about aligning with that intention. I'll just throw it over to Sky because I know you've done a lot of work around this. Yeah, I, I agree with what you were talking about, Nick. Um, so the deepest message that I'm living with right now is around choice. I think that we can come at the world from a perspective of lack, which is really the worldview that we have right now. You know, the big bang is a theory of lack. The big bang is the cosmology that we started with nothing. We started with a vacuum and into that exploded this, this thing called the universe really fast with inflation theory and, and everything. But that's, we're, we're even forgetting what the question is when we, when we talk about the Big Bang. The question is, how do we get something from nothing? That's an assumption that we get something from starting with nothing. And that's a worldview that is based in lack. It's the assumption that there's nothing. And in order to get something, we have to add to it. We have to work. We have to create. But if you think about the, the holographic, what I call the holographic paradigm, the mathematics of holograms, or let's, let's talk about radio waves. Everybody's familiar with listening to the radio. Well, you're sitting right now. If you turn on the radio tonight, you hear the station that at 90 million thousand hertz. But you change it to 101, you listen to 101,000 hertz. And all those waves are right there in you right now. What you're doing in tuning into the radio is you're pushing away all the others, carving out what you don't want, and what's left is what you want. And this is a great analogy for the way that I think the what I call the whole type, the, the holographic multiverse, how it works. Because in, in that model, you've got this tree of possibilities, which is like all the possibilities. Your job is not to create from scratch what you want, your job is to choose. And in choosing every day, choosing your path, choosing what you eat, choosing what, you, what jobs you apply for, choosing whether you leave your job or go on to a new job or not, choosing whether you apply for a promotion, choosing whether you talk to somebody new at work that you've never talked to before, choosing whether you put, it, whether you put in an extra few hours or not on a project. All of these choices are essentially carving away the branches that don't align with your choice and leaving the ones that do align. So I think ultimately the challenge that we face is a much more beautiful one than how do I create the life I want? It's how do I choose the life I want? Yeah, that's, a, that's beautiful. And I would say even moment to moment, like how do I choose to experience this reality, right? Am I, am I gonna choose to layer on my conceptual understanding, my, my bok chak, my karmic kind of uh, veils? Or am I going to choose to be as present as I possibly can and bring my best of intentions forward? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are really great, great uh, comments. And I want to bring something up because it's something that I think about and I'd love to hear your perspective. I have, um, so, oddly enough, I have some military uh, people that, that work on the show and I had a really amazing um, guy who's a Navy general, I think. Uh, and he reached out and just... Um, thank me for the show. And I was like, Oh man, that's interesting. So I think about somebody like him, because when I, when I was in law and security, I'd look at like some of the stuff in the world and be like, Hey man, I am really not for people hurting other people or suppressing them. If I were in the military or army, maybe I could do some, some positive things. And so mm -hmm. I think about right livelihood and saying, okay, um, let's say we got world war two, right. And that's happening. And they say, Matt, you want to go over and fight the Germans. And maybe I say no, because I don't want to kill anyone. Or maybe I say yes, because 
uh, Hitler's taken over the world, then that would be worse. Then I also thought about the experiment. What if Hitler won? And then he wasn't so mean. There's what's that movie with Jet Li? It's Hitler example is kind of bad with that, but there's a movie with Jet Li. Oh, I know what he, you're talking about. Yeah, where he does the Seven Kingdoms, and he's gonna kill yeah. the guy, and he's like sad. He's like, "What I'm trying to do is unite all seven kingdoms, so you guys stop killing each other." And Jet Li's like, "Oh crap, that's a good idea. I never thought of that." And he doesn't end up <laughs> killing him. And so there's like so many different levels you could you could see these things, and 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 I think that anyone's choice is is theirs to have and theirs to own. Um, with the military example, what I think about is like, well, if if I'm in my hologram and my reality, and and I'm not enjoying like putting myself in a situation where I might have to harm or kill somebody, when I make a different choice, that whole universe shuts off immediately. But then what people in that position say they say there's bad guys that we need to go get and so did the bad guys not exist right you know would, would all of a sudden something take over and start ruining your life i don't i don't think so um but i think about if we use that idea of of right livelihood and not harming someone else and everybody in every military did it then we would have world peace but it would have to be everybody it can be like somebody with their fingers crossed behind their back you know what i mean keeping their <laughs> arms and then, then they're the only ones with weapons so it's just a, like a unique paradigm i think of like how you could engage in that environment and get that direct experience of something very intense and potentially harmful and something you know that's why i, I don't want to harm anyone here you know what i mean i i, I, just, yeah. I don't want to do that but i also understand when i look at the world it seems like there's a lot of enemies out there also um, and so I choose not to participate that in that game, but does it mean that it's not real? Does it mean that, you know, human trafficking isn't real or these, these people are, are trying to um, do terrible things to other cultures or other people? And if I were in a position where there was a, like a force or, or a group of people that prevented that harm, that seems positive. So I'm going to stop there because I think that's the best I can articulate it. That's a great question, um, and one that has been talked about for thousands of years within the Asian traditions. And there, this is where there is quite a bit of disagreement between different traditions. And I'll, I'll speak from the Buddhist perspective, and I would love to hear Sky's take on this from a more modern kind of physics perspective as well. Um, from a Buddhist perspective, again, livelihood is determined by intention. So just because you're in the military does not mean that you are necessarily creating this negative uh, karma, so to speak, these negative ripples. It really goes down to your intention. For instance, you could be a social worker and actually be out to harm people and be completely selfish and be creating negativity for yourself and others moving forward. Likewise, I mean, you see the Shaolin monks, as you well know, Matt, um, samurai, you know, even going back to like the, the nobles in India, there was a warrior caste and, and, Buddha, many people don't know this, but Buddha himself actually came from the warrior caste and some of his best students were warrior caste people. Um, and of course, there's this idea of like, you know, the inner, the inner battle and, and all of that. But at the same time, I mean, warriors go out and they, and they do, they fight, they do that. And it comes down to like, what is the intention of the person in the immediate action that they're doing? And I'll give you one example. And this is a, this is a fascinating example many people don't, don't know about. It's a scriptural example, and it's, it's a story called Black Spearman. And you can look it up online. It's, all, it's been translated many times. Essentially, Buddha, in one of his previous lives, was this ship captain. And there was a guy that came onto the boat, and he had, I think, 500 people on the boat. And this guy was a murderer. And he, Buddha you know, had some clairvoyance, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. He knew that this guy was going to murder this entire, all 500 people. And just because he was crazy and Buddha tried every, or the future Buddha tried everything to stop him. Eventually he ended up having to kill this, this bad person. And because of that, it propelled the future Buddha into like greater and greater levels of reality. So like his, it wasn't a negative karma. It was actually a positive karma that he created for himself. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So yeah, absolutely. What was the name of the story? The black, what black, black spearman. The black spirit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the name of the guy that I can't remember if that was Buddha's previous incarnation name or the guy that he killed. But anyway, the point is that Buddha knew the causes and conditions, right? Whether you believe in clairvoyance or not, but most people don't. And that goes back to your Hitler thing. Like you don't really know what the larger ramifications are going to be for you be, to partake in any one action. So what you do have control over is only your intention moving forward. And then you have some level of skill. Right. So occasionally people have really good intentions and they just are terrible at what they're doing 
and they make it worse for everybody, right? But actually, that doesn't mean that they did a bad action. It just means that they just weren't that skilled at that particular action. Their intention was still very positive. Yeah, and what the, that reminds me of is uh, you, the quote that says, the only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. And also, sure. the whole entire Bhagavad Gita is about Arjuna not wanting to go to war. And yeah. I think about that, right? Because it's just like, it's an interesting thing. It's an intro interesting moral thing and i i think about it a lot too because i grew up doing martial arts and yeah. you know when you do that you learn that you can use your body and, and you can you know probably win the fight because you've practiced and so right. when do you use that quote unquote power or force and and when do you not and uh, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating thing and and there are times that we must definitely do something you know and i think that we know those times and so you know the the Bhagavad Gita is a very fascinating read just for that saying, Hey, you know, it's time to do something now. And, and you're doing it from a space of like, almost you must, you know? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. I think that, I think that this is a, there's a metaphor between the physical battles that we do in the world and the internal battles we do that mm. Krishna and Arjuna are doing in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. I think that <clears throat> the battle is, really from from that book I, I i really picked up like oh yes this battle is necessary i can't just avoid the battle by being as peaceful as possible because i am part of a a system both inside myself in my karma and also the world we live in is, is a system that's built with certain inherent endemic problems mm -hmm. that have to be addressed with power some kind of power to shift the thing in a certain way and what, what occurs to me in this question about using force in the world is that by the time a military intervention is necessary, by the time a physical forceful action is needed, we've gone a long way past the point at which we started getting misaligned. So when we talk about all the different people in the world that are, you know, doing bad things, well, they didn't start that way. They, they, many years ago became part of a system that influenced them to work in a certain way. And we became part of a system that influences us to work in a certain way, which is not necessarily a good way, right? We're all doing things that are natural to our state of environment. Mm -hmm. And then far down that path, years later, we end up coming head to head with people who have different values and, dis and disagreements. So if we want to really understand how to deal with force and violence in the world, I think we have to back way up and look at what's going on inside myself right now and how am I, what, what, what um, karmas or what uh, effects am I creating now through the system that I'm part of? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a, I totally agree with that. I'll, I'll even go so far as to say there are Buddhist teachings, like script, scriptural reference, where if you saw, let's, let's imagine that you saw um, a guy beating up an elderly woman right? And, and you failed to act in doing that, that actually it's much more, if you just sat meditating, right? There are actual stories about examples of this. They're a little bit different than this, but basically this is the gist. If you just sit meditating and saying like, well, I'm peaceful. I'm sort of like disengaged. That's actually a negative action because you could have used your power to intercede within that. Now, here's the, here's the difference between, I think, a uh, more ordinary perception of that and a, a real, a true practitioner. I'm not saying that I'm one, but Ideally, the person that's interacting and stopping that, that, um, that fight or whatever, that, that mugging, you should have as much compassion for the person doing the mugging as the person that's being mugged. And in, in fact, you're acting out of a wish to stop them from doing this harmful action. So it's like restraining right. them. Just like you're stopping like your two-year-old from like, hey, don't, don't hit, don't do that. You're not like mad at them. Whereas I think other people are like, screw that guy, you know, I'm going to go after that guy. And so you see that in martial arts like a little bit, you know, but yeah. it's no, it's like rallying this, this um, power to then stop it for both people involved. Yeah. And I think parenting for me has is, is been very impactful for how I think about this because mm -hmm. as a parent, I'm going to do certain things in protection of my family that are just natural to who I am as a human being. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means being forceful in certain ways. And sometimes that means with her or with my daughter being um, clear about boundaries. It doesn't mean I'm angry. It doesn't mean I'm being violent. But it does mean that I'm having some force. 
And I think that's a metaphor for just what you were saying. We can, we can have an impact with a force of our willpower, with yeah. our values. And it doesn't have to be connected to a negative emotion like anger, but it can be fueled by that. It can be fueled by anger, but not directed. See, I think when we direct our anger in the wrong place, that's when we cause harm. Anger is a powerful tool, but when we direct it at the wrong person, it becomes harmful. That's exactly. You, so what you're talking about is very much in line with like tantric theory, right? And so some of you, I, some of the people listening have probably seen these wrathful Buddha. It's like a Buddha that looks kind of scary. They kind of look like a demon. They're not peaceful. They're surrounded by flames and they're wrathful. But they use that term in Tibetan and in Sanskrit. Yeah, that's a peaceful, that's an example of a peaceful oh, yeah. one. I don't, I'm yeah. looking behind me. I don't have any examples. Yeah, the physicist there's, there's, there's has there's the Buddhist uh, yeah. painting behind yeah. him. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, there's some but demons it, and fangs in there you gotta too. You got to up your Buddhism yeah. game, bro. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, it's, it's like you can access the power of what people experience as anger f- and harness that, that power for good. And it comes down to like, is it anger or is it wrath? And wrath is like a very, um, a non self-centered state, but it still mm. has all the active ingredients of, you know, quote unquote anger. It can look like that, that from the outside. Mm-hmm. Here, I'm going to grab it. Well, I'm going to prove my. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to give us a demonstration. Is this... <laughs> yeah, <I'm gonna> show you. <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever had a demonstration on the show. Yeah. I've had some slides. This is great. There we go. See? So here, I don't know if you can see it. Very oh, nice. great example of some wrathful Tibetan Buddhas. That's amazing. Well, I I like how Sky turned it to like the inner battle. And that's how I read that as well. And I I think a lot of those ancient stories, it really is the inner battle of of what's going on in our mind. And I find it fascinating how many people, people, I would say most people are really really not kind to themselves. The inner dialogue is very limiting. It's very judgmental. And that goes out into the world. And that's where a lot of harm is. You know, if I think the fight analogy, if there's a guy beating up an old lady, when I reflect on it, I'm going to be mad at that guy because he's an asshole. Um, but um, <laughs> like if I can go over there with non-judgment, stop it. You know what I mean? And, and that's like the, the premium result because if you are in an altercation, the idea like as a martial artist is you need to stay calm. And so if we're yeah. perceiving our world and we're not judging people for, for who they are or what they're doing because maybe that person is mentally unstable, you know, yeah. and they're not even with their wits about them and they think that the old lady is a ghost. You have no but, idea it, what that is, but you've placed that judgment on them. So now it's changing how you act. But, you know, all this external, you know, what martial arts teaches me and what Buddhism has taught me and Zen has taught me and in the podcast and these great teachers is that the, the environment is going to be what it is. And I need to constantly train myself to master my inner environment. So somebody cuts right. me off, I can immediately get pissed off or I can be totally fine with it. You can literally train yourself to do that. And there's definitely levels of mastery. And when you do that and you're more focused on your inner world, it is going to be about your intuition, your contributions, your passions, and your example to other people, because you're, again, you're either setting boundaries or you're being very clear with um, how how you're navigating the experience and, and like that push and pull, you know, like as a, as a person in the world, you don't want to go harm people, but if somebody's going to attack you, you can, you know, poke them with a stick or tell them to frig off or whatever you're going to do. You have the right to defend yourself. But if you're really, um, you know, pretty clear and pretty calm and cool and collected that, that um, experience in the world is probably not going to happen too often. And I want to ask you guys, because we got about 10 minutes left. I know Sky's got to jump off and this has been amazing. And if, if you guys had like a question or something you wanted to dialogue on, because I know that if you ask it, it'll probably take us all of the 10 minutes. And I just want to throw that out there to see if there's anything that you guys wanted to touch on before uh, we close this. Well, can I stick something in there, Nick? Yeah, please. I, don't, <laughs> I have no agenda. Scott wants to talk um, about. It's, it's attached to what we were just saying, that it comes back to this, this idea of Maya. And I think that what, what I keep coming back to in my own life is how hard it is for me to know what's really happening. Mm-hmm. And I am interpreting everything through a filter of my own emotions and my own upbringing, my own beliefs. And so many decisions are made from a mental space where we've got our filters and we're saying, well, then it must be this. It's very clear that it's this. It's very clear that it's that. 
and then but someone else is saying it's very clear that it's this other thing. The, the types of decisions that come from the head are always going to be like that. And they're going to come through our filters of, and, and the challenge is that it's only later that we realize, oh God, what was I thinking? I totally didn't see that clearly. And we're all susceptible to this, not seeing it clearly. So this is where flow is powerful and being able to sense and feel is a big part of what in my course and in my book is around being able to feel the sensations that are happening, whether or not I associate an emotion with them or want to talk about the emotions or not, it's really about being able to be real with what you're feeling so that you're not showing away information can guide choices. When we choice is in alignment with the reality that's happening, that's maybe that's right action, you know, I think what we talk about with the eightfold path. Whereas if we make choices that are if I'm pushing away the feeling of my own shame or disappointment from something that happened to me and I'm reacting to somebody else with that, that I have no that, I'm probably going to create more problems, create more karma and not be mm -hmm. right action. So I think flow flow inspires us or it asks us to to drop into our heart, which takes us out of those filters and gives us more compassion. And so we do have to act with force in the world to get things done. And yet I think I keep coming back to a sense of uncertainty of like, but I don't know really what the forces at play here are. So I'm going to tread with that uncertainty as I go. Yeah, I, I think that was well said. Um, I think that another way to put it is those filters are, are kind of our stories about reality, right? And our stories are airtight in terms of, you know, we create our, our experience of something and we tell ourselves a story about that and vice versa and all that and it's sort of this feedback loop. Um, that person's like this or this person's like that or our experience is whatever. Um, and you can't really get beyond that. And there's two ways you can, you can combat that. One is having the freedom to choose a different kind of story, kind of like what you were saying, Matt, where it's like, hey, that guy could be mentally ill or you know, maybe they're having a bad day or who knows what all the causes and conditions and that can loosen up your tight clinging to that story. And that's sort of playing in the level of, in Tibetan, what they call lojong, which is like mind training. So actively taking on different perspectives and it's a way to kind of loosen that tightness. The other way that I think Sky's talking about more, and he, he terms it flow, is really like what he was saying, dropping down into your heart and really being able to actually let go of any and all kind of filter so that you have this experience of reality that is just that, an experience of reality that's unfiltered. I think for many people, um, at least early on in the path, that seems a little bit woo-woo or a little bit mystical, but it absolutely is a, a possibility, I think, with a little bit of training that most people can get to. And so the invitation then is like how and how often and how do you, how do you bring this into a lived and felt experience? And I mean, I think one way to do that is really finding a practice that allows you to drop into a deeper level of experience and, um, and just make that a daily practice. And it, and it, I mean, I think that some of my teachers certainly have reached an end point. I can't speak to that, but, um, there does seem to be a kind of lessening of karmic tendencies. Mm, those are really, really great insights. <clears throat> when you're talking about, I always love tools and strategies and one that I'll use is, um, you know, as I'm experiencing something, I'll just put my awareness in my heart. And mm -hmm. so as I'm observing the thing, but I place my consciousness in that spot, it kind of changes it. One mm -hmm. other thing that you might do with, uh, Nick, with what you're saying, you might imagine like somebody you love and respect, like my mom. And so I could be like, how would my mom deal with this? And yeah. she would have a, such a higher degree of compassion than I would. Um, and so that is, um, taking the experience and changing your perspective around it. Because when you talked about the stories being airtight, it's funny because we'll take only a little bit of information, what we're observing and immediately the story yeah. is formed immediately yeah. with all yeah. judgments and right and wrong. And you're coming yeah. in there as the judge and jury on right. all of these things and everybody you do and the, you know, everything you're experiencing. So I think that's a really powerful insight and something to consider as we navigate. Um, you know, there's a, a, an exercise that I do. Let me just share it real, real briefly. It's about reprogramming worry. A lot of times I, I know how often my, my day is filled with like one worry after another. 
and each of those worries kind of resolves itself. I'm worried I'm not going to finish this project on time. And so I'm, you know, Monday, I'm like spending the day kind of up level my stress dealing with that. Tuesday, I get the project done and it's, I turn it in, you know. So do I ever go back to Monday's feelings? Do I ever put myself back to Monday and say, oh, I finished the project on time. So can I feel what it feels like to be stressed about not finishing the project on time? Add in the information that I did finish on time and sit in that experience to go back and admit to who I was on Monday and feel the reality that I actually finished the project on time. I don't have to worry about it. And then in doing that and actually feeling that, reprogram the automatic worry that mm-hmm. comes up when I think about the next project. So now when, the, when I'm in the next project and I start to say, oh, God, I got to get this done by next Wednesday, how am I ever going to do that? Oh, yeah, the last time I felt this way, I, I realized I felt the difference in how it feels to su- succeed at the project. And so I begin to, to adjust the, 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 the intensity of the emotions I feel by going back and re-experiencing those emotions with the new information, with all of the information about how everything goes. Because mm-hmm. I think we, what we tend to do is just keep barreling forward with the same set of worries and the same set of anxieties every time and not actually taking in the information about how things generally tend to work out overall. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really brilliant insight. And I think that when you do that, I'm sure there's plenty of neurologists that would tell you, I hope anyway, it just would make sense that you would be building a new neural map. You'd actually be reprogramming your brain to have a new experience because it's the emotion. It's the emotion of worry that creates that belief in that frame of the world, right? So every time there's some sort of external thing that's going to create anxiety or worry, um, that part of your brain is going to fire off. But if you've trained it through more experience to say, no, we've been here before. It doesn't have to be um, this way. It could actually be a different state. You know, we can go through this in a state of flow and peace and ease and excellence. And you can actually program that in. And it's something that I'd actually use with my athletes because in snowboarding or in extreme sports, if you fail, and it could be in baseball and things like that too, let's say you strike out. Um, In snowboarding, if you fall really hard, um, you might never try that trick ever again because you're afraid of it and you just all of a sudden replay that replay it, replay it. And you just build that up, right? You would build up the worry or whatever that experience would be. And so the immediate idea is to go back in your mind and imagine you did it perfectly. The immediate Mm -hmm. thing. And then you just use also positive dialogue. And then also Mm -hmm. you want to assess the situation. Do I have the skill sets or the conditions right? Is my body right? Can I do this active visualization and go do it? And usually for me, it's a a technique that worked really well is if I felt really hard on something, I did it immediately after. Um, You know, I wouldn't let that fear um, go in because the next night you're going to be thinking about it. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Um, Right. It's a really. Well, I think think what you bring in there that I I wanted to include, which is the feeling it, you know, we're, we base our choices on our feelings. And if we can allow ourselves to re-feel something, mm-hmm. then we, are, we, are, we have the capacity to change it. Because it's only when we re-feel it that we have the capacity to steer that ship differently. Yeah. And I yeah. think it's also important to re- realize like it's an unconscious pattern, right? You didn't say, oh, I'm going to choose to feel worry for this. It's just your body goes, oh, crap, I'm worried, right? You didn't choose that. And so this is where I think the free will and the conscious element in the programming and how we can... Um, have a better inner experience and outer experience by being mindful of these things and then doing something consciously to kind of switch that program to what we would prefer. Mm-hmm. Nick, do you want to add something? Yeah. I mean, it, it's kind of starting down a new rabbit hole. I know we're at time here, but I, I would say I agree completely with all of that. And it's the feeling that creates the reality. And that's why, you know, in some of the more advanced meditation techniques, you're not actually just sitting in your normal situation you're you're imagining or visualizing or feeling your body made out of this divine enlightened light or energy right and so that's that actually is well recognized at least in the tibetan tradition as the fastest path to actualize those things and so it's very similar like we use it for of course snowboarding and healing emotional trauma but ultimately what would it be like to sit down and feel as if you were fully and completely enlightened Love that. That sounds amazing. Well, boys, this has been a pleasure. I knew it was going to be great. And it was, uh, do you guys want to have some clothing closing thoughts and where can people find more about you? Uh, Thanks so much for coming on. 
I've loved it. It's been great. Sky, it was great to be with you again. You too, um, and Matt, thanks for the invitation. Always a pleasure. And you can just find out more about me and what I do at nickeganphd.com. Yeah, it's great to be on the show with you, Matt. Nick, uh, it's great to see you. And uh, my course is called the Living and Flow Course, and it's designed to help you see the synchronicities that are showing up in your life and how you can start paying attention to where they're leading you without actually knowing exactly where you're heading. And there's lots of tools in there. It's the series. The tools are there to help you um, notice the emotions that are blocked and stop you from getting into flow and give you tools to get back into flow. And you can find more about that at my website, skynelson.com. Amazing. Well, and, and, and I want to say that as we go forward, you know, living in flow is about recognizing how the next thing to your dreams that are up here, you know, your dreams may be way up here, but the next thing is right here and it's waiting for you. And so, so notice what that is and type all hard into it. Awesome. Well, I appreciate you both, and I highly recommend all the listeners go check out both of their books. They're both amazing. Check out both their work. I know Nick is going to be dropping a course, too. Um, so these guys are amazing, super intelligent, and have um, – I like practical tools in this stuff, and both of you guys are able to dive deep but also provide practical tools for that next step, and I feel like that is absolutely vital when we are trying to improve ourselves and have a higher quality life experience, a higher quality consciousness and just uh, general well being. So I appreciate you both. Thanks for coming on the show and uh, thank you everybody for watching. Thank you. Take care. See you boys. Peace.